Hello and welcome to the Gaggle Boat Challenge, and if necessary, destroy media narratives. I'm George Samueli. With me today, of course, is co-founder of the Gaggle, Peter Lavelle. And today we have a special guest uh, who needs no introduction uh, to Gagglers <laughs> because um, Crosstalk is regularly featured on our locals uh, page and is very popular among Gagglers. Uh, and I'm referring, of course, to Martin J, who is uh, located in Marrakesh. And... Um, we could say that this is a kind of a, a late version of uh, crosstalk, or the <laughs> the what what got left behind on the uh, crosstalk cutting room floor. Exactly. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> um, but anyway, I thought the, the 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 topic that we want to talk about is uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Um, we've we've been very positive towards him, and we've defended him um, on a number of occasions from many unfair attacks. Uh, most recently, he was uh, accused of anti-Semitism um, in the media, New York Times, of course, leading the way, uh, but also on the floor of uh, Congress uh, with the usual uh, Democrat uh, fervent supporters of Biden you know, openly accusing him of anti-Semitism. Um, but uh, if you actually look at his, uh, uh, his pronouncements, uh, particularly when it comes to Israel and the Middle East, they are very, very troubling, not because he's anti-Semitic, but because he has um, embraced a very, very extreme wing of uh, Israeli politics. I mean, he sounds like a Likudnik. Um, and uh, he was recently involved in a debate with um, Jimmy Dore. And Jimmy Dore, obviously, you know, he's not a specialist on the subject. And you know, he, he openly said, I, I don't know that much about um, Israel and the Middle East, but he was kind of almost um, he knew jaw, enough. jaw agape at, at the, the assertions that um, Kennedy was making, which were um, really very extreme, even by American neocon standards. I mean, he went back into the history of the uh, the uh, Zionist settlers um, in the Ottoman Empire, into the history of Palestine, into the uh, origin of the creation of the state of Israel. He got it, wrong every step of the yeah, way. Yeah, he got wrong, but but he, you know he went along with that. In a, it was a very extreme position and he was recently diagnosed uh, very meticulously by Max Blumenthal and Aaron Maté and so we're left with kind of wondering what's what's really behind this why is uh, Kennedy doing this because it seems like a um, a self immolation he's alienating the kind of anti-war anti-neocon anti-interventionist uh, supporters who would naturally be inclined to uh, uh, be on his side but who are just shocked by uh, this uh, e extreme positions that he's adopting. So, Martin, um, you have the floor. What's your take? <laughs> My take? Uh, well, well, I saw it. I saw most of the interview, and um, a couple of things sort of um, jumped out. I mean, until this point, I, I don't know whether you're gonna, guys are going to sort of think of me as a bit of a weirdo, but until this point, I actually had a lot of time for RFK. I actually listened to a lot. Of what he said about domestic politics and the international circuit yep. and yep. i thought he was quite lucid he was quite clever he ran circles around biden you know he was a natural i've seen him on a lot of um let's call them fringe um internet shows um with which are which are very good ones um but then you get on to the middle east and my god jeepers creepers that is just how do you put it into perspective? It's 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 just a bullshit zone, which is like beyond anything else we've ever seen or heard of. You know, even APAC, even... Well, well even... Martin, it, it, I think, you know, I, I, I'm not really on the level of expertise as Max Blumenthal, obviously, but I've been following it for a long time. All three of us are. There'd be a lot of people in Israel that would blush listening to what uh, RFK Jr. had to say. Okay, yeah, yeah. There, but There's a certain also... line that they want to believe, but a lot... A lot of I mean, Benny he's, Morris, he's in a Benny zone. Morris, he's in a, for example, he's in, he's, or yeah, he's in, he's in a fantasy zone. He would he would say RFK Jr. is nuts. Yeah, I think he's in a fantasy zone. But the the, the interview, the, the the sort of post interview where um, Max Blumenthal and um, Aaron Matt uh, ran the interview and then sort of dissected it was actually really interesting. And um, well, these two guys are interesting. These two journalists are interesting because they're American Jewish journalists who don't buy into the entire Zionist thing at all. You know, they are 
very uh, uh, Max particularly spent time in in Palestine and the West Bank, and uh, so he could take this interview apart piece by piece. So that that makes them really interesting. But um, the point that uh, Max made, I think, is really valid, is that if RFK is doing this because he thinks it's a vote winner, then he's going to have a bit of a shock because there are a lot of American Jews who don't buy into any of that at all anyway. So what can we extrapolate from it all? What can we draw from this rant, which was so wrong, so uh, misinformed? I mean, is he woefully misinformed? Is he incredibly ignorant because of what he's been taught as a youngster? What's information, indoctrination, which has been handed down to his parents? Or cynically, is he on the payroll? Is he being paid a massive amount of money by, by a certain... <laughs> By certain group groups to to come up with this because uh... well, well let me give you I agree Martin I think something happened a few days ago maybe a week ago I don't remember the quote unquote rabbi's name Max Blumenthal mentioned truly it. but he got truly. on stage Brooklyn the, guy, on... The, the rabbi you're thinking is Rabbi Shmuley of Brooklyn Shmuley. and here he's on stage with the Shmuley and he's saying that his father was killed by Palestinians, because all Palestinians are, you know, um, homicidal maniacs. Well, RFK Jr. has a very has a completely different take. He he doesn't believe Sirhan Sirhan killed his father, and so he's sharing a stage with a man that says it. You know, he, he's not. He didn't interrupt and say, no, 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 no. This, this is not my my understanding. Of, he just let it fly. I mean, what's going on there? But, that, that's but, beautiful. Yeah. But I, I wonder though, particularly yeah. when he was on Bill Maher and he gave the entire history of what he thinks happened to his father very calmly. He deconstructed the entire scene. It seems very plausible and very believable. So why would he get on the stage and let someone repeat something that he believes is patently untrue? But I wonder whether, though, you know, if you think back of the arc of his um, family's history, and I don't know whether how much that plays in 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 his thinking, but you have the old man, Joe Kennedy. Very anti-Zionist, very anti anti-Jewish, you know, whether it's anti-Semitic, he's very anti-Jewish. He he hated the influence of the Jews. He thought the Jews were dragging America into World War II. Um, he was very strongly opposed to that. He hated the Jews in Hollywood. So that was the old man. And then you have JFK. Now JFK had very troubled relations with Israel because he was, was suspecting, rightly, that Israel was building the bomb that Israel was uh, assuring the United States that it's only, oh, it's just nuclear energy, you know, a peaceful use of nuclear energy. And Kennedy said, I, we don't really believe you. We'd like to inspect your nuclear reactor at Dimona. And the Israelis kept fobbing him off. And JFK was getting more and more pissed off that eventually they were tricking him. They were lying to him. Now, Bobby, he, he makes his run in, in, in 68. He kind of, he, he knows that he has only really one shot at uh, at uh, getting that nomination, you know, because he's 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 the outsider. The party uh, bosses are behind uh, Humphrey. You know, he, you know, he, he, they don't they don't like Bobby. They, they, they the organized labor particularly didn't like Bobby. So he had to essentially embrace the uh, you know the rich Jews, much as LBJ had to as he as he grew more and more unpopular as a result of Vietnam. He went for well, the, the U.S. liberty, George. Exactly. That's LBJ. And that's so he decided to throw in his lot with the uh, with the wealthy Jews. And he became fervently Zionist in 1968 during his 68 campaign, which I think provoked Sirhan Sirhan. I actually do think Sirhan Sirhan was responsible. What, what I'm just saying is that no, he, I know, I know, I know what he's been saying. No, I, I, but but I do think that, you know, they, you know, they, they have all of his writings. You know, he was crazy about Bobby and Israel. So I kind of wonder whether he's doing the same thing. He thinks he's an outsider. And he thinks that, hey, this is my shot at uh, at, at uh, getting the nomination. I have to essentially curry favor with all of the sort of the the wealthy Jews. Um, in a way, Trump did something similar. I mean, Trump also outside the 2016, he had to really go on bended knee to these um, wealthy Zionists, particularly Sheldon Adelson. So I just wonder whether that's the calculation that's uh, going in his head. Well, what, one thing that uh, it came when I was thinking about today, um, knowing that we were going to speak now, is that is his political calculation. First of all, he 
No one likes to be accused of anti-Semitism if they're not an anti-Semite, obviously, okay? It's one of the worst slurs that they can throw at you. Is his political calculation, this is a question to both of you, is that he can take this position and not really worry about it because it's marginal. There are, there are people that are very interested in this topic. It's very, yeah. very important to them. But in the wider scheme of things, is it really that big of a deal, okay? Yeah. Because a lot of people, I think if you were to take a reasonably well-educated person in the UK and in the United States and let's say, I'm going to pay you 50 bucks to watch this, okay? When it's over, what do you think? I have no idea what they're talking about, most people would say. Yeah. So but, uh, I, I think, think that's that's a, it's a marginal cost. It's, everything was marginal about the interview, because I think that um, when you do something, an interview like that, about so many uh, issues which are so important historically, and you get them all wrong. Yeah. Um, who do you choose to do that with? Do you choose, uh, you know, CNN or BBC, somebody who's going to do their research, somebody who may have a particularly uh, zealous uh, approach to the whole subject of Israel and Zionism? Or do you choose, with no disrespect at all to Jim Dore, but do you choose somebody who, by his own admission, doesn't know much too much about the Middle East? And if you look at the interview, it was very passive. I mean, Jim, Jimmy Dore couldn't really, yeah. he couldn't really question anything. You know, and so what you're doing is you're really just giving an open floor to a monologue, a talking head for what was it, over an hour, you yeah. know, for him to go on, for him to make assertions which just took my breath away. I mean, to even suggest that the Palestinians uh, fought with the Ottomans when they didn't really have too much choice about it, you know. I mean, and, and they and, and the Palestinian authority will pay. People to murder Jews? Man, this is really Jews just, around the world, not just not just Israelis. Really, it's off Jews the chart. The world. Yeah. It's off the chart. It's right. just, I mean, even the most, you know, on my program in, in years past, we had people come Zionists coming from Israel and America to take the, you know, to give their position. I never heard anything like what RFK Jr. had to say from those people ever. Right. Well, that was that, well, that was a, that was the thing that um, he presented this very extreme kind of I know almost like a rabbi kahan uh even you know commentary magazine view of israel because remember when that woman joan peters you know was that that great hoax of the 1980s she wrote that book um uh people uh, a land without a people people without a land. yeah that's something yeah that, that's right exactly i can't remember but but it, but it was a hoax i mean it was but it, but it, it received for a while very favorable reviews in which she argued that the Jews were actually a majority in Palestine, and that the Palestinians oh, yeah. uh, came subsequently, and the, uh, which and, and Kennedy uh, subscribed to that. I mean, he said that yeah. in that interview that that was that yeah. the Jews were the majority. Um, so this is a footnote, George. This is a footnote. Norman Finkelstein. That's what he wrote his doctoral dissertation on on that book to disprove it. And Noam Chomsky warned him: if you do this, they will vilify you to the end of your end of your days. And he was right, right. right. It was from time immemorial. That was the title okay. of the book. Um, I got the subtitle right, didn't yeah, I? Ex ex exactly. <laughs> but it was obviously a hoax. I mean, obviously the Israeli government used her to write that book because you know she came from nowhere and then she vanished completely. It after was the a book CBS was News producer. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she and had Norman been... Finkelstein believes that it was actually the CIA that wrote it. Yeah, no, I I think so because it was you know she she went through these documents, so somebody had to have provided her with these documents and and, and so on, and then the, the book vanished. One Finkelstein essentially launched this attack, and then others started attacking it, and then and then it was just uh you know, it was But what's interesting is that Kennedy has embraced that position, that very extreme position, uh, that really the the Palestinians were kind of the interlopers. Uh, and that the uh, you know the, the Israelis were there, the Jews were there. They were the uh, majority, um, and uh, and, the, and you know they 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 came there because you know the Jews were providing them with work and and so on. So it's it's that's what's so extraordinary. He wasn't doing the usual neocon. All oh, the Palestinians are terrorists, are terrorists, and we're trying to give them peace, and they they just want to wipe us off the the face of the earth. He went much more extreme than that. He went into a whole kind of ideology, kind of this this kind of historical revisionism that, as we've said, even the Israeli historians uh, don't accept. Martin, yeah, um, it's 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 the whole thing is just knocked me on my on my back feet. Um, 
And I do wonder, I do wonder whether your point of it being fringe is is quite a poignant one. Is it fringe in terms of its political outreach and also fringe because of, uh, within its media um, reach as well? I mean, was it really in, meant to be absorbed by- Oh, well, well, that's just the point, Martin. And yeah. When you watch the Jimmy Dore interview- well, Why would he do that? Why would he do that? Why did he do that? He did yeah. not have to do that. He no. did not. He could have just said, "Yeah, no one likes to be accused falsely accused of something like that," and then move on. But the funny thing is, though, journalists scorned, you know, is 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 something quite funny. In that, um, Max Blumenthal actually asked to do an interview with him, and of course, he didn't get back to him. Now, Max, I think, has got three hundred thousand followers, and he said, "If we'd done an interview, we could have collectively at least had a million views." Um, but he didn't get back to him. He didn't reply to him. And so there is, it's 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 funny because there's. When you do that to journalists, they always take it too personally. They always, they always lash, react like that. But well, it, also, also, Martin, let's be fair. Max Blumenthal and others in his orbit have committed a good part of their life to this issue. Yeah. I mean, when yeah. you look at what, when he was speaking with Aaron Maté, who was also, he's a Canadian Jew. I mean, yeah. he it's, it's pretty understandable that he took it very personal, okay? Because it's something that I've pointed out to George on a number of occasions, Max Blumenthal must have a, some kind of photographic memory because he can yeah. pull up his names. Yeah. I mean, I, I I have to have it in front of me, and I probably will mispronounce it. Okay, yeah, but names and dates and cultural amazing. references, and and yeah, he's he's kind of a Google in, in himself, you know. Um, but so in the end, you know, to rebuff them and not do the interview didn't really work because they did the interview anyway. In many ways, they took it apart, you know. And but I think the anger, the the sort of um, passion from Max is more about Look, you know, we're used to dealing with a lot of bullshit about Israel, but this, this is just so beyond anything we've ever had to look at, you know, so it, we have to do something about it. We have to actually put this guy straight because there will be people tuning in who will absorb some of this, you know, and... Uh, but on top of it, I, I think, I don't know if it was Aaron or Max who pointed out, they only got through the first eight minutes and then gave up. Oh really? Oh, I didn't. Yeah, know that. that's right. It was it was a long, uh, long interview. But again, it's big because he he went into all these historical references, and of course, every time you uh, address a historical reference, of course, that takes uh, time. Um, but he, 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 you know, Kennedy had absorbed, accepted all of the ridiculous cliches. I mean, which again, like for instance, that the Arabs attacked Israel in 1967. Well, nobody even believed it at the time. I mean, you know, no one at the time like, accepted that version that uh, Israel was actually under attack in 67 or that NASA was really planning to push the Jews into the sea and all this. I mean, this, this, is, this is the worst kind of hoary cliches from yeah from 1967 um but he accepts all oh, the 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 camp david uh agreement that uh the yasser arafat throw away it was the this amazingly generous offer they will be they were going to be given the whole state to themselves and he said no and everything you know again these are all absurdities that uh that, that have been refuted time and time again and so it, it still goes back to the question i mean why is he doing this? I mean, you know, be, the people who were, who were attracted to his campaign were attracted precisely because he was the anti-war candidate. And, yeah. uh, and, and you know, you, we've had in the past anti-war uh, figures. I mean, we had Bernie Sanders and, you know, and Kennedy is much more intelligent than uh, Sanders, but but at least Bernie Sanders- That's not saying much. Not saying much, okay, but, but <laughs> when he came to Israel, um, you know, Sanders, Sanders' position, well, I just don't like Netanyahu and that um, got him off the hook. You know, I just hate Netanyahu. Um, this, but he would, but he, he, Sanders would never have accepted anything like this. I have to really wonder because I, I, I'm pretty sure both of you saw at least part of uh, Bobby Kennedy's interview with Hannity. And remember when he gave the alternative, our understanding of events in Ukraine and in the mainstream media, it's the alternative. Um, he made a lot of micro mistakes. And, and, and I listened to it and I said, well, his, he's, his heart and mind is in the right yes. place. Yes. But he made a lot of micro mistakes. Well, a lot of mistakes. Yeah. 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 yeah, he got days. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, Absolutely. you know, and then I watched what he did on Jimmy Dore. And then I, I had to, a, a conclusion I drew is that, is this like a quick study thing? Did he do a quick, he found out, oh, the part of the Republican base does not like this war and the, the polls are going in that direction. Did he get a quick study 
uh, did he watch two or three videos and try to commit it to memory or or in the, in leading up to the the door interview did he just pick up a primer you know like a 25 page primer and you know he is a smart guy obviously did he just well, he must, have, he must have a very good memory but i mean he may he well just have, imbibed he may, it really quickly and he may, he may well have, really he may, because with, with the ukraine narrative if he were to look at a transcript of it later, he, even he would probably say, ah, the, uh, this doesn't make sense. This, these two things don't make sense. Okay, but anyway, I mean, he made the effect. So I, I have to wonder if something like that's going on because, and then if he is doing that, and that is an important question I pose to both of you. Well, how many, if he does do what I just said, does he do that with almost everything else outside of, you know, um, uh, uh, environmental uh, law and stuff like that? I mean, it, 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 it it has shaken me to my foundations because right. it just until I saw up. that, I was like, no, I, yeah. I like this guy now. Right. It's but but it, just going following up on what you just said, I mean, if you if you watch the whole of that show with Aaron Maté and uh, Blumenthal, I, they, I they, they, then they they were joined by Michael Tracy. Now Michael Tracy is, is um, he has been very critical of Kennedy from the beginning. He he thinks Kennedy is a fraud, a phony. Um, uh, that that he's basically all his life he's just been a Democratic Party apparatchik. Um, and so so when he watched this, he said to them, "Yeah, that's pretty much is what I what I told you. You know, this is this is not not someone you should rely on. And that you know he 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 gets he gets everything wrong, and then ultimately." You know, and then he brought up the issue of Russiagate. So there was Kennedy uh, embracing Russiagate for years and years, and then he said, "Oh yeah, he abandoned all of that." And uh, and then and I think Tracy asked, he said, "Look, I mean, this is a man in his sixties. He gets it all completely wrong uh, on Russiagate. Then at the age of seventy, he said, "Yeah, yeah, I, I got it all wrong, but you know, now now I'm right." <laughs> so it is it is a very very odd uh, odd well, thing also, about George, it. Is this this kind of very primitive political angling? Okay, I mean, it doesn't take you know you uh, all of us talking right now could quickly do a, a Google public opinion poll Ukraine and can see that it's going so, uh, supports going down. And then you know, as someone said to me once on my program, he said, uh, um, "You can never be too pro Israel." Okay, when it comes to electoral politics. Okay, so it seems to me. It's 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 a kind of a cheap, um, kind of primitive, juvenile pandering. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, that, that's right. And I think that if, if that may well be his calculation, I think that's what I was saying. You know, the analogy with him, his father. That's sort of, both. This is my opening. You know, I'm going to be more pro-Israeli than anyone else in the in the Democratic Party. But it, it's it, it's maybe it would just be a very wrong calculation because th that anti-war base that he's trying to appeal to that that is not going <laughs> to they're not going to accept this. And without that base, he doesn't have any support. I mean, that you know, because the Democratic Party establishment hates him, and if he can't get the anti-war base, then he's done. I mean, there's 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 nowhere to go. I think Peter's point though, about um, looking for just uh, talking points, just quick research talking points may well, you may well be onto something there. I mean, I've, in my career, I've interviewed a lot of politicians um, for television. And there is a certain type of politician you, you, you work out very, very quickly early on in, in the interview that has a very good short term memory for details, for facts, for bullets. And those types of politician usually go to their researchers, their communications people, usually young, very, very young, very clever people, and say, write me 25 points about this subject. I want bullets, I want single lines, and they digest it, and it comes out very quickly. And the way you can tell that they've just digested points is that you follow up with, you know, questions and you get fobbed off. You, you can't go any further. And I think that's probably the case with RFK. I think he's gone to somebody or an institution and said, I don't want detail. Don't give me any detail. You know, I've got this interview coming up and it's a very passive interview. And no one's going to ask me any difficult questions. Just give me some bullets, which I can study over a few days and then just unleash it all. And this obsession he has with, he's actually stated that I am the most, um, I am the biggest supporter of Israel that there is. He actually, I read it just recently. So that's his ticket. That's his identity, you know, that he wants to. Um, and I think he's banking on no one actually looking too carefully at those kind of fringe well, that's, interviews. That's exactly right, because it, it 
when you look at the Hannity interview and then the door interview, I think you both agree with me. Um, he has this kind of stage presence and he basically is trying to, he, do, he doesn't want questions. He wants to filibuster with his narrative. Yeah. And he, and with, with Hannity, it's easy because Hannity's just dumb. Okay. And Jimmy Dore is a very um, um, skillful, talented guy. And he's very much up with the news. And he 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 reads antiwar.com or you know, something like that that he keeps abreast. Okay. But you know, I mean, you needed a, a Max Blumenthal, you needed a, 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 a um Finkelstein to, you know, to say, hey, you gotta slow down here. Okay? Yeah, but that's never gonna happen. Never gonna happen. Oh no, well, yeah. Yeah. And well, I, 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 I I'm very curious on what the afterglow is gonna be because the YouTube is on fire about this, okay, and people are disgusted. disgusted disgusted by it right right yeah i i, I think so and i think that um he started on this path of uh, this fervent support of israel you know long long before all the accusations of anti-semitism came up i mean you know that this has really been from the start and um and and, and i think he is making a calculation that you can't be too pro-israeli uh in american politics you know just the, you, you know you can't because you know, you've ultimately say well it's Holocaust. I mean, if you you know if Israel doesn't get everything it wants, you know, then it's going to be uh, you know the the end. I mean, he referred to Iran as a genocidal regime. What yeah. what does that mean? What I mean, you know, he's he's done that before. He's done several times. He's referred to, what what does he mean by that? I mean, I, I imagine it's just simply because they, they say mean things about Israel. But there's no no other evidence, whatever, that it's a genocidal regime, and yet he churns well, this this rubbish out. Um, and and they again, you know, again, that that's a sort of you know extreme, really extreme right wing talking point. This is stuff you get from you know um, the Frank Gaffney, the of the, uh, <laughs> the 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 National Security Center or whatever it's called. Um, that's that's the way they talk. Or Sean Hannity. I mean, this this is way way out in the sort of you know in the you know right field. In the Republican Party. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, so it's, uh, I mean, he, he's decided that that's going to get him some uh, support. Well, I don't, I don't he, see he, where he's going to get that from. I mean, they, that's, he, it's the wrong constituency he's appealing to. It, it may well, it may well be that he's had media consultancy, some big, powerful media uh, consultancy firms that cost a fortune, and you drop a couple of million dollars into their laps, and they come up with these very clever people who who give you. The consultancy that you want to hear and some consultants may well have said to him don't worry too much about um extreme hardcore details that won't filter through into mainstream press what will filter through is you are the man you are the number one israel guy and who can blame him for for lapping that up because look at media media is no longer instant facts and nuances you know it's 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 that kind of that kind of advice is um is actually not too bad advice and it will well, see I, I don't know we'll Martin, see how it I works Dennis Kucinich is his campaign manager, okay? And I've had him on my program a number of times. Right. I, I really would like to talk to Dennis. Is that, did you green light this? Because I know you know better, okay? I mean, he he is, he Dennis Kucinich was, was the almost all by himself anti-war congressman, okay? I mean, almost stood alone. And, so, and if he's giving... Bobby, this kind of advice, I have to wonder what the hell is going on, because this does seep in, and it is ni not 19, it's not 1980 anymore, okay, there's a whole lot more knowledge out there, and it is, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, particularly with uh, uh, university students, when I, I mean, as Norman Finkelstein told me, he said, the, the leaders of most of the pro-Palestinian groups in American universities are Jews, okay? No. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know, you know, I, I doubt whether Kucinich is behind this. I mean, with, with any presidential candidate, it's the candidate who makes the decisions. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the, the campaign manager, they're there to do as they're told. Uh, so it's, you know, he's it's like, you know, it's with the same with Trump. I mean, Trump is the one who makes his decision. He can have his campaign manager. Say, oh, that's not a good idea. That's not a good. Don't say this. Don't say that. But it's Trump was going to make those decisions. And so I think same with RFK. I am sure Kucinich does not agree with any of this, um, but he's he's now really, you know, along for the ride. I mean, he, he can't just simply get off without, of course, undermining um, Kennedy's campaign. I can't think of, uh, 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 
coming as an underdog, as an outsider, I, I can't see how he's going to be able to make any um, um, gain any momentum from doing this. I, 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 the way I look at it, and again, we'll have to wait for um, uh, um, uh, this to um, wait for the afterglow. And we're one of the first afterglowers here, but um, I think this is extremely damaging. I've never seen anything like this in, in, in watching politics. You know, I've I've seen and heard batshit crazy stuff, but this one takes it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I think so because um, he you know he carved out a position for himself yeah. which could have could have been quite useful to him um you know yes of course biden would not have given him the time of day biden would not have agreed to uh debate with him but he would have got some votes um in the uh you know in in the primaries and who knows where, where that might have led him but now i just don't think he's going to get any votes in the primaries i think it's just uh you know i think it's just like going to sink you know without trace i think that um the the what max blumenthal and aaron Maté did and you know they have great following i mean that they, it's a big platform um people are going to say hey the, 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 you know we, we we don't want some extreme likudnik uh some netanyahu light uh you know as our candidate so it's just you know it really is just self-immolation what makes it worse, George, is that people like Max Blumenthal, Aaron Maté, Jimmy Dore were positively predisposed yeah. to him, irrespective of, you know, the, you know this yeah. issue. But now it's just like, you know, now people are going to run from him because of that. Okay. Or, one, or, yeah. or, or worse, worse will be he will be asked now by other leading commentators who have those shows to come on their show and explain himself, actually go further. And that's like saying uh, to somebody, the way you get yourself out of a pit is keep digging. You know, that's just a downward spiral for him to fall into. So I think you're right, Peter. We will have to see. We have to wait for a few days to see the reaction from mainstream media, but also whether he takes up the challenge to do the same thing with somebody else. You know, it'll, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how far that goes. But I think um, I think George, you're right. I think he's got no hope now. I think he's blown it. I mean, I know a lot of Democrats who were. Uh, really appalled by his um, position on abortion but now now you're just becoming a freak you know now now I mean, we all had a lot of time for you at one point you know and i was really taken in by him but i can't take him seriously now i just i just can't take him seriously and i wonder how many people um will feel the same way at the, at the, at the ballot box the one thing that he might do um <laughs> i don't think he'll do it but he could um um uh you know change the dynamics if he does actually agree to um do a debate with blumenthal now you know he threw out a challenge before show me where i'm wrong you know if if, if you could show me i'm wrong then you know I'll, I'll change my view so if he says okay I'm, i'll uh debate blumenthal show me where i'm wrong and then blumenthal said well you're wrong wrong bomb 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 um i said okay well maybe you're right. Maybe I'm going to study this a little bit more. You know, I'll go. You know, re read some of the books you tell me. I don't think it's going to happen, but at least it could help him. I mean, because I think, well, okay, you know, he, he took up the challenge and he took seriously Blumenthal's criticisms. Uh, at the moment, I think he's just in free fall. So that, that to me, that's the only th way that I can see that he can uh, change the dynamics well, for him. And see, George, again, using the, using your example, for if if I were to uh, have access to um, to him after his Hannity interview, I would have said, you know, you're in the ballpark, okay, but you know, you know, keep in mind this, this, this name, this date, and stuff like this. You know, you know that that you can massage that, you can work with that, okay. But what he did with Dor, I don't know how you work with that. You, 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 you I mean, you, so your fundamental understanding of modern history is is completely flawed, okay. I mean. Then are you qualified to become president? I mean, that's what happens to you, right? No, I. But I think if if he, if, I mean, I think you know, if he, he would have to undergo a, a major uh, uh, rethink. I mean, he would say, yeah, okay, maybe I've just been wrong on this issue. He can still do that because because look, ultimately this election is not going to be decided on the politics of the Middle East. So even, so even if you say, yeah, I got it wrong, I've been reading the wrong books, I've been listening to the wrong people, maybe I should take a more balanced view, you know, then, you know, take up some of the issues that uh, Blumenthal has pointed out. That, that He could still 
you know, come out relatively positively because it's still not the central issue. I mean, it was Ukraine. Ukraine is a central issue, but yeah. Middle East, I mean, it really, you know, the election isn't decided on Middle East politics. So he, he could help himself like that. I just don't think he's going to do it. I mean, I, well, the, I, I, the, the problem is the people that can help him and the people that can help him with his uh, path using alternative media, using these podcasts, which I think is very, very smart because there's a lot of him and you can get, you can learn about him more than like any other candidate right now. But I think there's going to be a lot of people, as Martin has said, you know, okay, you can come on my podcast. I want you to explain to me the Ottoman Empire, okay? And <laughs> it will get, get buttonholed, buttonholed on that because, you know, we're all in the media sphere right here. Well, obviously, all of us want to look smart, okay? We want to sound authoritative. And so you can get someone that's pretty mediocre and just say, you know, Max Blumenthal, he did a critique of it. I'm going to ask the same questions, okay? I'm going to look very smart. I'm going to look make him look bad. That That's an easy path to do. I mean, George is right. I mean, I'm, in the media appearances he's going to make in the next two weeks or month, people are going to say, but going back to your conversation with Jimmy Dore, yeah, right. but not not many. To be honest, I mean, not many people do know much about the Ottoman. I mean, you know, even if they wanted to challenge him, they wouldn't really be able to do it. He he probably Especially... knows more about the Ottomans than almost all of the interviewers, with the exception of Blumenthal and, and, fair, and fair the enough. others. So, fair yeah, enough. yeah. I mean, we need we need we need Jay Leno, you know, to um sort of go into shopping malls and doing a vox pop and asking people. You know, um, the the capital of Oklahoma State. You know, is, is, is Americans knowing history, Ottoman history. I mean, come on, I don't see that. Yeah, but we, but we all agree that this is a third rail. Okay, I mean, it, the it, it's certainly not it, it is a it's certainly not a majority topic. You know, that's not in the top ten. You know, but for maybe what ten percent, it is a you know, it's a riveting topic. Okay, and I think that this is just going to follow him. Uh, um, I mean, just as all three of us don't have the words to explain what we saw. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, th 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 that's right. Um, but you know, if we go back to that Senate test, no, it wasn't Senate. It was a, he was before the House, um, and you could already see as he was saying these nutty things. I mean, he was you know, bring, like as he was saying about this, the the U.S. government gave three billion dollars. To the genocidal regime uh, in Tehran. I mean, it was just like saying idiotic. The U.S. gave no money at all to, to uh, Tehran. It's not a genocidal regime, but he seemed to liken that. Like, How can you call me anti-Semitic? I'm calling. I'm. I'm referring to Iran as a genocidal regime. It's a complete non sequitur. And, and, got, and because yeah, it's got, such a non sequitur, you had to wonder how deep is his understanding of the issues. I mean, the idea of saying, well, I can't be anti-Semitic because I'm a fervent supporter of Israel, again, does show a remarkable kind of as if and, learning. You know, it's a very shallow understanding of the issues. As if anti-Semitism in Israel, are, there's a direct connection, okay? This is what the neocons have been doing for decades, saying, you know, if you don't support Israel, you're an anti-Semitic, which doesn't make any logical sense whatsoever, right. and we all know that. One thing before I forget saying it, um, because we all remember, we were young, younger men, but when, when his father was around, and one of the calling cards of the Kennedy legacy, family legacy, is civil rights. And it's really quite remarkable that JFK started the process, or Robert F. Kennedy, he had his, uh, he had that tour of Appalachia, you know, seeing the poverty of whites and blacks um, during, in 68. And, you know, he, he was, he, he, he was adored by many black leaders because what his brother started and whatnot. And, but he can't, he's so blinded by this ideological approach. He cannot see the suffering of a group of people called the Palestinians. I mean, it, it seems to me he's so blind to, you know, that it, it, it's all about rights. It's a, a rights issue. Do, you know, pe these people have to have the same rights as the, the majority uh, or the, the country, Israel, that claims to be up, uphold these rights here. I mean, having a, a Kennedy say that for, you know, again, we're older, we remember this, but it's really quite astounding. Yeah. Um, well, well, that's it. I mean, and I think as I say, it goes back to, I think, his his father. I mean, now, you know, his father had very little time for the uh, the Palestinians. I mean, he was basically his position in 68. Hey, 
give Israel whatever he wants. I mean, that, that was the, the ostensible excuse that Sirhan Sirhan, I think, um, presented as his excuse for for killing um uh, kennedy it was oh because he promised to send i don't know whatever you know 50 jets to um israel um the the talking points that he presents he says well hey you know israel well that's the you know, kind of the imperfect embodiment of democracy and it's surrounded by these uh horrible savages who don't know democracy uh when, when they see it you know and they they are monsters so he doesn't see it as a civil rights issue. He says, "No, no, no. These are these are people who are determined to crush this island of democracy and sweep but, but, it over by George, this of totalitarianism." George, I, I think that in in a in the longer term, if he talked about you know, if you want to mention Israel, we we have to work on the uh, on rights, human rights of all. And I think he would get a pass. You know, I mean, maybe not um, a, a standing ovation, but you know, that's a. And politically speaking, it's a way kind of segue out of it. I mean, again, on the door interview, he marched, I mean, forcefully into it. I mean, he could have just put it in an icebox and moved on to something else. OK. Yeah. 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 No, no, uh, that's right. Um, but, but I think that's, uh, you know, I think he's decided this is going to be um, his uh, calling card. I mean, I, I do think that. He, he believes this. I, you know, I, I really think that this is he this, certainly this, sounded this. like it. Yeah, um, because he does seem to have made some study of it. I mean, you know, he got he got this material from somewhere. Obviously, you know, he he'd been reading, you know, fervently Zionist uh, texts. So they they presented all this. So, you know, I mean, this argument: the Palestinians were on the wrong side in World War One. I mean, where did he get that from? I mean, he had and to, what does he, it mean? Okay. Exactly. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> and and and, and the, the, the Palestinian that the Jews were the majority uh, in in Palestine and the Mandate uh, territory in the 1930s. He got he had to have got this from somewhere. So he's he's, he's obviously getting all of this. Um, now maybe he is worried about this the, the charge of anti-Semitism that may be playing a role in this. Um, but it's uh, I mean, it, it really is just a case of complete self. Immolation. I mean, it 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 makes no sense in any political sense for him to well, go George, down this he, path. If he's so smart, so smart when it comes to viruses and and and, uh, and how to, how to uh, deal with uh, medical emergencies and all. I mean, if he has such an encyclopedic knowledge about those kind of things, don't you think you know it kind of goes to reason that you know he you know. Put, you know, jump in with two feet and look, you know, read Norman Finkelstein. OK, I mean, we, you know, I mean, it's breathtaking for me that he probably read a 25 page brief from someone, remembered it quite well and knew that he would, you know, in two or three days, he would have to just spill it out. And that's exactly what he did. He spilled it out. It was a script in yeah. his head because he went from point to point to point and he knew Jimmy probably wasn't going to put up much resistance. I love Jimmy Dore. I've been on this program twice. Very smart guy, but he was out of his depth. Yeah, right. out, of his, out of his depth. And and probably, probably now in hindsight, he probably regrets the interview. You know, he probably would have thought that perhaps he should have done some sort of researching and, and, and asked to have seen, you know, a bit of a flavor of what he was going to be facing because he did look rather like a, a young deer blinded by the headlights, you know. But um, you're avoiding, you're very polite, you're very kind, you're avoiding this word fanatic. I think the guy's a fanatic, I really do. I mean, to come up with those historical contexts, which is so banal, is one thing. But then to make the leap to say that everybody in Janine is a terrorist and they are yeah, yeah. hiding bombs, you know, and... God, I mean, and then the um, reference to the Americans every year give... Um, the Palestinian Authority, eight hundred million dollars, which they use to kill Israelis with. Wow, you 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 really got to be going somewhere um, to to keep a straight face and keep the eye line in an interview like that, and and to carry it off. You know, when no one, no one believes that, no one, not even the most. Well, it, it, and also, which is really interesting, is that uh, to. Um, uh, paraphrase Max Blumenthal, not all Jews feel like the same way about Israel, okay? I mean, a, a, as an American Jew, he's insulted by that that uh, um, uh, line of argument, if you even can call it one. I mean, it was so, 
illogical. It fell apart. You, the, the, you, you mentioned probably the best example. Why would the U.S. government give the Palestinian Authority the money to kill Jews? I mean, I mean, you don't have to be all that bright to say that's kind of a strange comment. But there were some things that he could have taken some shots at, um, which his researcher, whoever it was, didn't um, feed him with. He touched interesting on the subject of the corruption of the Palestinian Authority, which is a sort of a, a faux pas for a lot of journalists in the region. The Palestinian Authority does have a corruption problem, definitely. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and he just touched on it as though he didn't know too much about it, as though it really was a bullet of a bullet in his in his talking points, you know. But the, the, what what made me a bit sick was the reference to the money of the, the, the Americans, because he knew that if he said that, that would that would really stir up a lot of shit, you know, to actually spell it out to the American taxpayers who aren't familiar at all with the region, you know, and the details, $800 million being paid. Um, you know, everyone knows that's for salaries, you know, and, and usually it's backdated. Usually the, the, the functionaries who work in these ministries aren't, aren't paid for months, you know, and they have to beg the EU to give another tranche of aid and this sort of thing, you know. So, but um, the Janine stuff was particularly revolting. And um, I, I think at a certain point, I can't be the first one to mention it, but, you know, he's going to become the sort of... Um, the freak sort of candidate when it comes to the Middle East, you know, um, are we going to see a new genre of Jimmy Dore type people who've got talk shows who just go for these kind of salacious subjects just to get the clicks and to, and to just, uh, to stir up um, all these. Well, I mean, uh, let's all be fair. Jimmy Dore wasn't asking for it. I mean, I think he, he was the deer in the headlights. I'm sure he regretted it. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. He couldn't believe it. Uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it either. I, w- I was dumbstruck watching. I said, I, you aren't really going to go there. Oh, <laughs> Kennedy. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, no, but, uh, that's right. But that was that was interesting when he, he, he makes this, uh, I made the comment, I think, that the um, Israelis don't practice torture, um, and that, which is kind of interesting. Again, the Israelis themselves don't claim that they don't practice torture. I mean, it, it, it's only, again, their apologists. I remember once talking to some guy who, who was an editorial writer at the New York Post, and he was ridiculing the idea that uh, Israel practices torture. So I wrote this editorial, ridiculously, Israel practices torture. You know, what's the worst? They said, oh, sleep deprivation. Well, that's not torture. I mean, yeah, all right, they practice sleep deprivation. That's not torture. Oh, they they shake people. Oh, 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 violent shaking. Oh, dear me, you know, violence. And, hey, that counts as torture. Sleep deprivation counts as torture. Violently well, shaking they, someone they, is torture. Not- the United Nations defines solitary confinement as a form right. of torture. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, and for Kennedy to to say is, oh well, they don't, and they they go the meticulously that they only uh, hit uh, military targets. You know, really? I mean, again, you know, watch any news broadcast and you see, you know, Palestinian children playing football and being uh, killed. You know, no, they never they never target any civilians. It, it struck me so much. Because I, I can remember um, uh, while at university, undergraduate, when there would be apologists for Israel. And it's really remarkable that it was almost put like in a time capsule and Bobby Kennedy re- repeated it in 2023. Because I can remember these things being said. They would be groups from Israel coming and they say, oh, no, we don't know torture. No, we're, we're like you. We're like you. We don't do that. And, you know, basically describing Arabs and Palestinians as savages and all. I mean, I, I thought that was kind of retired decades ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the question of the free candidate is, is is an interesting one, because by embracing this, remember, he, he already had a reputation of, of being somewhat eccentric, um, but he could get away with it because after all, what the New York Times dubs eccentric um, is what other people say. Yeah, that sounds pretty sensible. I mean, the COVID restrictions and the whole COVID hysteria, that, that wasn't exactly rational. And, the, you know, the, the vaccine nonsense, everything, that wasn't rational. And, and Ukraine, again, you know, he took, he's taken a very sensible position. But once you, you get this together and you say, he's kind of a, a free candidate. You know, what other crazy things is, are we going to hear about? You know, <laughs> he's you embraced. Go. There you go. I I agree with that 100%. What else is he going to say now? Yeah. Le Freak. We've made, we've made him Le Freak. He is the Le Freak from now on. Le Freak RFK. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right, George, you well, want to wrap this up? Yeah, I think so. I think it's been a very good discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for uh, joining us. Um, and, um, you know, we'll we'll do this, uh, you know, on a regular basis. So um, thank you, Peter. And uh, remember, if you like the gaggle, please like, share, and subscribe. See you soon. Bye.